Oh, Gary is here. There we go. That's an empty chair. Oh, here he comes. He's like me. It's cold. I I am super cold. We're, we're just about ready to head down to Florida, and so you know maybe we'll get a, away from this. Well, my wife is just three sleeps. We're leaving on Thursday. We go, we're stay at this place uh, called uh, Saint Armand Circle, and it's uh, kind of an island. And uh, you know, it looks like it's going to be in the seventies. Anyway, how's Gary doing? And Charles, good. Oh, great. Well, I was just uh, telling Don that I had not had a chance to read Roy's uh, um, uh, comments, uh, you know, about the dream. He says uh, um, that Thor is not the prince uh, for Dawn. He's the one that sits on the right-hand side uh, over here. Yeah, because he's too collective, you know. I mean that Dawn needs the secret unknown uh, brother, you know, and she's interested in the unseen brother. Dawn does not recognize Astarte. Well, you know, there's all kinds of signs pointing to that that it's Astarte. Um, it's like um, in uh, uh, I I don't know if you ever read the book Candide by Voltaire, you know. But he was talking about this artist and he said he's the sort of artist that when he draws a picture of a chicken, he has to write under it chicken so everybody knows what it is, <laughs> you know? So it, it's kind of everything is pointing to Estarde, but, but she doesn't look like Estarde until the end when the blue starts emitting from her mouth. So she's sort of a mysterious person i'm moving this thing around because i'm reading it here and uh um dawn needs signs and the gods to recognize her as Dardy's power puts dawn on edge but dawn has power she's the driver she drives her own car now that's something we didn't mention she drives her own car with the gods in the back seat and uh, uh, so Dawn has the power of navigation and transportation. How many dreams have we had where we haven't been able to do that? Uh, now the regular woman, who I think is Dawn's trickster shadow, does a shadowy thing. And Dawn's more ego conscious personality appears more self-deprecating, just the opposite of the goddess. It doesn't appear that she sees the goddess in herself, but the God's world would not be interested in her if she wasn't a goddess. Her thing is she cannot um, partake of the blood. She and uh, her trickster brother, uh, trickster shadow side have rather pour it down the drain than partake. But it seems to be like Tim said, the blood of Christ. You know, it's the, uh, it, it represents, uh, you know, a, uh, divine blood you know and uh the blood of the redeemer so it'd be kind of the life essence and it's just be being wasted so that some people can't have it i don't know it, uh the blue in astarte's mouth is logos or the spirit why is dawn marie rebelling against taking the blood it begs the question just like the pit dream dawn is the bride black gentleman doesn't want to know uh it because he doesn't want her to become aware of the uh, her power the blue light of estarte in order for her to get out of the pit she must drink the blood and she, which is is the ambrosia or whatever you know but anyway that's a wonderful dream i mean i um does anybody have any more thoughts about it and then gary i think you're up if you have one dream I, I still don't have anything. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. I've been having the, the most odd, ordinary dreams imaginable. 
you know, uh, but I actually, uh, some of them have actually been pretty good uh, when I looked at them a little more closely. Um, uh, well, I would just go over this one more time. Uh, you know, we're, we're driving the car and uh, Thor is in the back seat, yet he doesn't seem to excite us. We just say, oh, there's the God of Thunders here. So hmm. wonder where he came from. You know, and we doesn't seem to bother us. But, but there is a, this unseen, you know, and the seat's empty. We look back and it's empty, but we know he's there, you know, and it's the, it's the unseen brother of the thunder god. So it is the, um, where, where Thor is the more visible aspect on the right-hand side, this is the invisible aspect that's behind our back and in the unconscious. And it seems to be the the one that has the active uh, activating principle. Okay, and then um, I think because of the appearance of these two beings, suddenly we're going down the street to the mother goddess. You know, and it's because the the logos and his brother appeared in the back seat we now have access to the mother goddess. And yet the mother goddess seems to be very, um, have a very human character. She's very like us, you know, and uh, until we see that, no, she's not like us. She has the blue fire, uh, that our blue, blue uh, emanation that comes from her mouth. So she's, um, has a, intimate connection with the uh, inner world, you know, uh, that, okay, then, then we go into the, so the, from this, that, hi, Roy, we're just talking about your commentary. Okay. On Dawn's dream. So from this, that, you know, he, uh, um, we see uh, suddenly this woman whose brothers is has divine blood. So like Tim said, it's it represents the blood of the Redeemer or the saving presence, that life essence of the saving presence. So this is the most important substance of the saving presence. And yet um, this shadow figure doesn't think it should be shared with anybody. And so it goes down the drain, not available to anybody, including us, you know, who probably need it more than anybody, you know, but um, so there's, there's an aspect of, there is an aspect in our sight, in our um, consciousness that takes the most precious thing in the universe, the life essence of of our saving principle, the principle of our our redemption, and flushes it down the drain. You know, so now what aspect of us takes takes what aspect within us takes the life essence of what is the is the uniting, saving, redeeming thing within us and just flushes it down the drain. Now, I think we that could be said of any of us, you know, and I think the, the idea is, is that we don't take any of this for granted. I mean, we take all of this for granted, you know, I mean, we um, don't take it seriously. R Roy, did you have any further comments? And I thought maybe we could do either Charles has some dreams or Roy, if you have a dream, Gary didn't have one. I think Gary, one thing that I do is uh, if I work on one dream, then another one will come, you know, I don't know, but plus I'm very, very aware, right? And especially of hypnagogic images too. Dawn, do you have a, Dawn has a question, her hands raised up. Go ahead, Dawn. Um, you, since, since you're doing, um, discussing 
Kundalini and um, Sunday sessions. This isn't something I, I know about. I would just say I was exposed to it. Things come to my attention now and then, and I've I've seen it with um, talking about like I don't know. Uh, I've seen you use other words besides sexual energy. I've seen you replace that word sexual with something else. Libido, libidinal. Okay. Yeah. So I, I've seen the idea of instead of releasing that normally the way people do the idea of um, retaining it and redirecting it instead of I guess transmuting it and I didn't know if the like the pouring down pouring the blood down the drain could and, and me feeling like it was wasted could be um, having to do with that it was just an idea well you know there's two types of uh, of uh... I think you you know what my <laughs> dreams are telling tell me anyway, and I I think this Tim's dreams are telling him this too over and over again, is that the um, the sexual energy is to create the divine child, at least in the inner world. And uh, I don't know about the accidental outer world, but in the inner world, it's to create the divine child. And if we use it for autoerotic purposes, you know, in other words, to just get our own thrills, and it's not related to transformational activity, then the feminine feels offended, you know, some way. Now, I think it'd be the same uh, principle in the in the um, with the animus, I don't know exactly. It'd be a little bit different. It, you, you know, now now I, I'm just going to throw this out there, and then I'm going to shut up. But you know, the the idea, and this this seems to to ring some truth to me, is that the the feminine earth. Now let's not talk about any real woman, but let's just talk about this mythologically. Okay, so we're not talking about any person. We're just talking about the mythological ground. The feminine earth um, wants union with the spirit because it lifts it and makes it, um, brings it, uh, allows it ascent. Okay. Now, the male... The masculine heavens, okay, descend with a different attitude. Not for ascent. It seems to be more of, of a power principle or something. And once they've contaminated themselves with the earth, they want to go back up. They don't want to stay with it. Where... The feminine earth wants um, union permanently. You know, the, uh, the, uh, um, the male tends to be like a bee that jumps from flower to flower. You know, in fact, this, this is really the story. It's a wonderful story of, of how um, there became two genders, okay? Uh, you know, there was originally just one gender. Now, okay, what confused you? That the blue coming out of the feminine figure. Um, yeah, now that confuses me a little bit too. I mean, the only thing I can say is that that feminine is, um, has, a, uh, is, um, has a hermaphroditic aspect. And the fact that she comes out of the store almost tells us that she's the feminine Hermes, you know. There's an aspect of her that is both male and female, you know, and uh, and and what what led us to her was Thor and his unseen brother. Uh, let's let's hear everybody. I I um I always get in trouble when I talk like this. <laughs> Gary, what do you think? Yeah. Um... Wow, I don't know. This one I really struggled with. I'm I'm going to hold off on any comments until I hear what everyone else has. Yeah. 
Well, let Roy, you've been uh, waxing eloquent on this. I, I we were just kind of reviewing um, uh, what you said, but go ahead. Okay, uh, I, I'm coming from a, a different set of uh, uh, platform. Uh, uh, I'm I'm coming from the Donald Cal shed about the mm -hmm. personal spirit. Now I'm I'm considering the blood, the personal spirit, I'm bringing in Christ and all that stuff. I'm just saying uh, it, it's very difficult to get in touch with your personal spirit. I mean, that's the part of you that's able to detach itself from all the conventions and the socialization. So it's kind of scary. So <clears throat> coming from Cal Shed, he's saying that uh, it's very common to see in people uh, that the archetype in their dream is the protector persecutor. It doesn't want the individual to get in touch with their personal spirit because they will be traumatized. So my opinion coming from this, uh, these theories is that Dawn doesn't want to be re-traumatized. So she has this protector persecutor archetype that prevents her whatever means it uses to not let her get in touch with a personal spirit. You know, that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, what, now, what do you think, Tim? Um, let me just add one thing first. It doesn't have to be the blood of the Christ. It's the blood of a divine male presence. So, I mean, the problem with Christ is he's got so many connotations, which we don't want. But go ahead, Tim. You are the Brit genius that came up with that which uh, well i loved it when i heard uh, it but go ahead i don't think i have anything yet to add mm -hmm. yeah uh well yeah i mean we just uh, we're kind of going over uh some of the the things because i think it's a very important dream uh, charles do you have anything to add to it um yeah i mean as far as the blood goes um you know i i I guess I could see that as like just a kind of raw vital energy and this idea of that, you know, if it is not to be, it, it's the blood heals people, right? In the dream, it has yeah. a healing property. Um, you know, it, it's just interesting that, you know, if it's not being used properly, then it's just disposed of and wasted. Um, just goes down the drain um that is uh just that whole image and idea um really resonates with me right now because i've been um i've been more focused on like psychic energy and uh just you know every and everything that comes with it um i said in the chat that uh you know uh, the the goddess figure is she has that blue smoke coming out of her mouth. I was like, well, uh, blue is color of the throat chakra. Um, maybe it means something like, you know, you to be using some of your psychic energy in order to, um, you know, speak uh, in a way that is going to be transformative, let's say. Um, and maybe this is something that um, um, maybe it's pointing towards the energy needs to be transformed into that way. And um, that uh, she needs to, uh, you know, be using that chakra and channeling the vital energy towards the throat chakra, uh, whatever that may be. Um, or whatever that might mean. Um, and I think the idea of the Thor and, and the brother, I think that's been pretty, um, um, not like, you know, explained, but I, I don't necessarily have any more to add on that in particular. But yeah, maybe um, that, um, and, and just the idea of, you know, this energy, it's, it's a healing energy that's like plainly said in a dream. So maybe it is speaking 
uh, in a way that will heal yourself and others. It, it's a much more beautiful and human image than the rocket that lifts her out of the pit, you know. And, and in her case, you know, the rocket lifts her out of a pit. It's sort of mechanical and everything, you know. And then her rocket just goes ver uh, horizontal to the ground and doesn't lift her out of the pit. So that the rocket was the redeeming thing in that dream. In, in here, uh, so, but we can't participate in it. In this case, there's a little more human aspect that is represented by blood. Now, the, the idea that it happened is this very mythological thing of we're, and Roy points this out, we are driving and navigating the car. And in the back seat is Thor and his unseen brother, who we can't see. He's, he's in an empty seat at our back. Yet the fact that they're in the car with us navigating suddenly leads us to the Great Mother. And then we find the Great Mother there is associated with blueness. And uh, we don't really know what blueness means exactly, but let's say it is Vishuddha. You know, it's the, it's the throat chakra. Okay, well, what that kind of means is that once, once we've, we've reached the throat chakra or the Vishuddha, let's look at some of the things, you know, like James Hillman. I, my wife was talking to somebody yesterday who had all kinds of trauma. Uh, she, you know, she helps all these troubled women. And they, she was on the phone for two or three hours. And I was asking her what it was about. And she says, well, you know, her mother was not a very good nurturer and uh, she's feeling resentment about it. And she's trying to, trying to raise, be a nurturer to her children even though she's a single mother but they kind of think that she unloads their troubles too much on them you know and they're kind of almost grown and and I said well you know I, I, I hate to say this but and I don't really understand it but you know that and this is really a Vishuddha statement James Hillman used to tell people who who suffered even though they suffered trauma in their life his question to them is, was this, and it's a Vishuddha question, okay, or a throat chakra question, is yes, you experienced that, you know, but a lot of people have experienced that and have moved on. And how, what, that thing that you experienced, how is it going to affect your behavior in the next five minutes, in the next hour? In the next day, you know, what, is, how is that going to uh, affect that? Now, if you were really Vishuddha, what you, in Vishuddha, you would say, that aspect of me experienced this. You know, the, the idea with Vishuddha is that in the, in what happens in the environment, okay, in our accidental relationships with the environment, and then our reactions to it, you know, are uh, in, in, in the realm of psyche, you know, everything, it's the only reality there is psyche. So uh, some things can happen in the, in, in the uh, outer world and how do we react is, is depends um, on us, not on what happened in the outer world. And when, you know, that's what editor said that we uh, assimilate the shadow when we stop blaming others. Now that's kind of a little bit Vishuddha too, you know, is, uh, um, but anyway, the blue light, uh, if it is the throat chakra is saying, would say to us, um, you know, uh, everything that happened to us in, in our life, are we, uh, action to it is our own responsibility, nobody else's. Does anybody have any comment on that? I mean, I don't, I, now listen, I'm the most naive person in the world, so that's what I told my wife, don't go by anything I say, because I've been li living a Peter Pan existence all my life. And, you know, those who can't do, teach. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Tim, what do you have to say about that? Now that's just contrast that with contrast the dream of the rocket and the and the blood 
and then what um, uh, this the uh, uh, just the aspect of, of for instance you know Viktor Frankl in his Man's Search for Meaning I don't know if you've ever heard of that book yeah, you know, but he that. was yeah he was a survivor of the of the uh, death camps in in Germany and uh, but you won't really hear one recriminating word out of him. What he tried to do was find the meaning in that experience and not let it, and, and you can contrast that with Elie Wiesel, you know, um, who sort of became an avenging angel of the, of in, in a wonder, I don't know, have you ever read Elie Wiesel? No. Oh, like Night and, and some of his books, just absolutely prophetic. I mean, it's like reading Jeremiah or or oh. Isaiah or something. Oh. But I mean, he was. I don't even want to talk about it. I can't talk about it. I mean, there. You know, I I spent all of my uh, young youth, uh, you know, reading. I I, I mean, I was uh, majored in in Hasidism, <laughs> Judaism, and it's just too painful for me to talk about. It. You know, one thing Abraham Joshua Heschel said, though, it just kills me, you know, is uh, uh, that um, prayer may not save us. Now, he's talking about the death camp. Prayer may not save us, but it will make us worthy of being saved, you know. So, anyway, yeah, I mean, beautiful. yeah, it's absolutely beautiful, but... Uh, the idea, I think, is if, if in, in Vishuddha, let's say Astarte is bringing us a great lesson. And the lesson is, is from the Vishuddha world. It's that everything that happened in our life, uh, our reaction to it is our responsibility. Nobody else's. We can't help the accidental tragedies that occurred to us. But the one thing we do have control over is, is how we react to them. Now, sometimes it's impossible to get over. And you know what Jung said too is that um, the, only, the only way to heal a grievous wound is to be in service to others who suffered the same wound. You know, so like in AA, the curing thing in AA is this. One sober drunk needs another sober drunk to talk to. Like a man lost at sea needs a lifeboat. And that's what they say. And yeah, they this, mean it. This reminds me of a lecture I heard. I lived in uh, Vienna for a while. And I went to a lecture at Freud's house by a, a guy from Yale who was an expert in PTSD. And he talked about um, PTSD in kind of the same, the same words that, that um, his theory is that PTSD has been passed along every generation since, you know, since we crawled out of caves and, and the male of the species has always been the warrior. And, and we, just inherit this kind of PTSD attitude all through the generations. And I, I, he just really changed my, my way of thinking about, about that, that woundedness because he says somebody who's been through combat and suffers from PTSD simply cannot accept that another person has been through what they've been to, through unless they're also a a combat veteran. So it's, he says it's very different than other kinds of PTSD. Anyway, I was thinking about that just as you were talking. Um, I, and, and I don't know whether they sur suffer real nerve damage or something, you know, you know, people who have like, um, you, you know, one of my relatives had two nervous breakdowns, you know, and basically because their nerves had been, their nerves had actually been damaged and they developed Meniere's disease, which is, uh, so if they ever had any trauma, they would lose their hearing, you know, part of their hearing, they kept losing their hearing, you know, and so they 
had to be kind of protected from trauma, you know. Uh, but and you know, I'm not really um, an expert on this. But just just the the general themes, and then maybe we can hear a, a dream from either Tim or Charles or Roy, if you have one. Uh, is uh, is um, we are in the ego and driving down the road and suddenly the divine is with us. And there's one divine that's very collective and has no effect on our, uh, our uh, uh, as an energy evoking symbol. But there is one and that is the unseen brother of the collective hero. The unseen brother of the collective hero does evoke energy in us, which is of a, a real transformative character because we can feel it. Now, the activating principle of those two being in the back seat suddenly opens up the mythological world and all the signs point to the divine goddess. And we get, when we get there, she's a babushka. She comes out of a store. So I think, you know, there is an aspect of her that is both masculine and feminine. So she's, um, you, you know, there's an aspect of her that's that's uh, her, has some hermetic qualities. She's not totally uh, the mother goddess, you know. And then so we're left in this realm. One here is the unseen divine masculine deity, and the other one is the um, is this um, mysterious. Um, Let's just put it this way: is she's a mysterious uh, woman with divine power, because she's not doesn't look like a goddess, but she is a mysterious woman with clearly divine power, which is puts us on edge, because we know of her great power. Okay, change scenes. Okay, that's over with now. Okay, now you're in with a woman whose brother is divine and whose blood heals. And yet she doesn't uh, want anyone to have it and pours it down the drain. So now if that's our shadow, who really needs the, the healing blood? We just came from uh, the dream where the, the rocket ship goes up, ours goes horizontal. We just rode with the divine feminine and saw this. Um, so, so we've seen the center okay now here's the healing essence the healing essence uh you know in uh uh in uh, uh, uh let's see Sven mccool you know uh had uh, was having a fight with jeremy dodine you know and uh, he was pursuing him and and because uh, he had ran off with his uh um his his wife or girlfriend or something and uh, because he had the love spot and and he had a hair whenever he would brush his hair like this and any woman would see the love spot she'd immediately fall in love with him and so then uh, she runs off with Jeremy Dodine and Finn McCool chases him and then somehow Jeremy Dodine gets uh, uh, injured by a boar and he's lying there dying and Finn McCool comes up to him and says, well, and this is a sorry sight I see right now, Jarmid. And he, he says, you look a little different than he did before. And, and he says, he says, oh, yeah, but the, but the uh, water of life is just five paces away. You can bring it over to me, Finn. You know, and so, so Finn goes and gets a handful of water and he lets it run through his fingers before he gets to Jeremid, uh, and Jeremid dies. So here's the healing water, you know, or the healing water of life. And the shadows pouring it down the drain. Now, could that that's the that is the follow-up to the first half of that dream. And it to me, it it is it is a recurring it it is the same dream as the one we had before where our rocket ship goes horizontal and can't lift now dawn if you have anything i'm not exactly sure what uh the the um 
the aspect of this that you haven't mentioned, if you if it is, that has anything to do with um, some type of a um, uh, a union of of uh, uh, some any kind of a sexual character with uh, with the animus or something? Because I. I, I mean, maybe you could explain that a little bit more in the chat, and then I'll I'll get back to you on that. But um, anyway, does does Tim or Charles or Roy have a dream that they want to discuss? Anybody? I've you, you got I've one, got Tim. One I can add. Yeah. Well, we're you know we do want to hear uh, the follow. -up. I mean, I tell you, I've learned so much from your dreams, Tim. I don't know if you have, but. I can speak now about some things I never knew about before. Yeah. Seriously, I did not, it was a revelation. Go ahead. Um, okay, I'm putting this in the chat here. Okay. Let me get my word document out. This is, um, this is a very strange one. I've been summoned by Putin, perhaps to make a work of art. He has perhaps a rival whom I like, but I'm unsure if I can trust him. Many people have been gathered in a big room standing along the perimeter, the walls, as Putin sits at a desk in the middle. I have one chance and just enough language to ask him about his association with one guy. It's a kind of an accusatory thing. Putin keeps looking at his dog, which has come to me. Then it's time to sleep and I'm wedged between the rival and another man. And the rival gets up in the middle of the night to call Putin. They must, uh, they must be very confident. They must be very confident. Um, okay. I, I think that refers to- He must be very confident. The fact confident. that I'm, oh, it refers to his uh, being confident that he can wake up Putin in the middle of the night. He's very confident that he can wake so, up Putin in the middle of the night. Yeah, so confident in the relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm astonished, astonished that I'm privy to this inside conversation and yet can't understand a word. All right, now this is a real uh, good interlude from the dreams of the feminine because I don't really see the feminine here. Right, there's, yeah. there's no feminine at all in this one. Okay, uh, we've been summoned by Putin, you know. Now, you know, you know it's kind of funny that uh, you've ever heard of Rasputin? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was the, uh, uh, this kind of sorcerer of, of, the, of the czar's wife, you know. And it's just kind of funny because they, they're Putin and Rasputin kind of remind me of each other. But anyway, we're summoned by Putin. Now, I don't know what you think about Putin, but I would say if I was summoned by, um, by, uh, let's say, um, oh, like uh, Pope, uh, uh, who's our Pope now? What's his name? Pius or Pope? Uh, uh, Francis. Pope Francis. If I was summoned by Pope Francis to do a work of art, I'd feel a little different. If I was summoned by um, Ang Angela Merkel to do a, a work of art, it'd be a little different. But when I'm summoned by Putin, what, you know, what I'm, I'm thinking, I am summoned by a very neutral, uh, almost tending on the malevolent side. Uh, that's one of the funny things about Putin and his, uh, uh, you, you know, the Russian regime as compared to the communist regime, it, it's a little more neutral, yet it's, it's, it's very, uh, uh, it, it's not quite as starkly uh, opposite to us as uh, Brezhnev and Khrushchev and Stalin were, you know, it's, it's not really at war with us, and yet it isn't friendly to us either, okay? So um, anyway, uh, we've been summoned by this somewhat malevolent character 
to make a work of art. Okay. I think he's totally malevolent. Yes. Okay. Totally malevolent. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, he's 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 um, he's not quite Stalin, though. You know, he's uh, and he's not at war with us. You know, but he's uh, uh, you, you know, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He is definitely, let's say, a black figure. Okay. A black figure uh, wants us to create a work of art. Now, really? Okay. Okay. Now, um, now, what when, when you say he has perhaps a rival whom you like, but you're unsure if he could trust it. So, what what's the idea there? Is that you are um, uh, are you going to uh, do some counter espionage or something? Uh, what's the idea there? Well, that guy strikes me as kind of like this Navalny character, just an opposition figure oh, that yeah. seems to All be right. um, that seems to be more reasonable. Okay, maybe this dream was precipitated by that the events that are happening right now. There, right, I'm exactly. sure they are. Okay, so um, anyway, so the person who imprisons a, a, a force for good wants us to create a work of art yet um, we um, while we're there are in contact with the uh, force for good okay uh, so now did you actually go there though do you think to create the work of art or are you uh, just gotten the invitation and not acted on it yet I, my feeling is I, I know nothing about it. The only reason I'm there is because I've been, uh, I've been given some kind of invitation. Yeah, and it's almost doesn't, you, you know, when you're summoned, that isn't really much of an invitation. Right, you know? exactly. It's just you're ordered. <laughs> yeah. You are ordered to come and to create a work of art. Well, so meanwhile, uh, this, this, okay, now this is starting to look a little bit better. This to me is sort of like the husband in the crazy woman dream. Okay, the you know you know the husband in the crazy woman dream is all powerful for some reason. The husbands they're just all powerful. They have control over the insane asylums, and they are summoning summoning the dream ego to create a work of art. Uh, you know the dream ego doesn't seem to be really down with that, and then so so it's suddenly now in contact with with the rival to uh to this um to this almost dictator you know uh and uh, so now many people are gathered in a big room standing on the wall as putin sits at a desk in the middle okay now um is the rival there too in the big room i, I would guess so but i don't know there's yeah. maybe a hundred people it's a lot okay I have one chance and just enough language to ask him about his association with God. Now ask who, who are you asking? Are you asking Novotny It feels, it feels Putin? to me I'm, I'm pointing out to, the, to Putin and the group, his association with somebody that is gonna uh, expose him in some way. Uh, so expose a, Putin or Novotny? Yeah. No, Putin. Okay, so, um, uh, all right, now let's see. Um, where did I lose this? Let's see. Many people gather in a big room, standing along as Putin sits in the middle. Now, what came after that? I think I lost it. Let me see. Uh, just. Oh, um, you just said that. You did. You said that. It doesn't written down. Um, that. Uh, okay. No, here it is. Putin sits at a desk in the middle. Okay. Now I have one chance and just enough language. I think I deleted that. Uh, okay, there we go. I'm going to copy that, and put it back in here. Okay, so uh, now now everybody's gathered in this big collective. Putin is sitting at a desk in the middle. Everyone's gathered around this sort of uh, malevolent figure, and you have just one chance and just enough language to ask Putin about yeah. his association. Yeah, right. Yeah, to ask Putin about his association with this guy. Now, why would you ask Putin that question? Is it 
because it's conditional about whether you're going to do the work of art or not, or, or you're just um, trying to be helpful to the other person. I think I'm trying to expose Putin. And you're trying to expose Putin. Okay. Right. So and it, yes, it may be the I, death of me for all I know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. We just want enough chance uh, to ask Putin about his association with, uh, with, uh, another malevolent being, right? Or is it with Navani? I don't think it makes a difference. It's yeah. with somebody that somebody that's going to uh, expose him. Yeah, yeah. It's something that he's done that is nefarious. Okay, I have just one chance and just enough language to ask Putin about his association with one guy that will expose him. Let's see, I'm just going to type that in here. Okay. All right, and then then it's time to sleep. <laughs> Wait, no, Putin keeps looking at his dog, which has come to me. Okay, so you asked Putin the question. He didn't answer you. I didn't ask the question. Oh, you I'm didn't getting, ask the question. Getting ready to ask it. Getting and he ready to ask my it. way, and so I think, well, here's my chance. All I'm right. Looking at his dog, which is at my feet. Okay, yeah. So um, Putin is looking at his dog, which has come to you. Uh, so it's it's this um, the instinctive force. So let's see what's in in this dream. There is the malevolent dark being, who might even represent the devil or something, you know. And then there is the dream ego, and the dream ego is is trying to um, expose this malevolent being. So. You, you know, we're not sure who it is. We're going to have to talk about this. I'm hoping other people can, can help me out on this. Uh, and then Putin looks at the instinctive aspect, which has come to me. And then suddenly, okay, we're, we're shifting scenes completely. Now we, it's time to sleep. So now we went into the unconscious. So that, that's the end of that first chapter. And uh, so now we are wedged between... Novotny and another man. So we're in the middle of, uh, of, um, of, of sort of the answer to this riddle and the rival who gets up in the middle of the night to call, they must be very confident that he can wake up Putin in the middle of the night. And I'm astonished that I'm privy to this inside conversation and cannot yet understand the word. Word now. I'm starting to get the gist of it, um, but um, let, let's keep talking about it. And I think we'll 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 all uh, understand it a little more. Uh, Gary, do you have any um, uh, way of um, helping us orient here? Oh wow, this is a tough one. But you know, it does. It, it seems like a situation that you know you're being there's something that's calling you know from the dark side and and art is art is the soulful representation of it so it is a way of recognizing it and not only is it a way of recognizing it but you actually want to expose Putin and, and maybe that is part of the art, of the recognition of the situation. So, but before any of that happens, you are trapped in this, in, in the entire situation. I mean, you know, you're in grave danger. I mean, you're between the rival and another man and you're unconscious, you know, you're in sleep. Well, let, let's think of it as a spy movie, okay? It's a spy movie and it's got a plot. So let's start out that it's just a movie and it's got a, a spy movie plot. I think that's gonna help. I think you helped out there, Gary, with what you're saying, because I, I think you made it into a spy movie plot. What, well, what do you, go ahead, Gary, do you have any more comments? Oh, um, so, you know, this rival is going to wake Putin up. And, and to me, it's like, you know, is, is this confidence well-placed? If he's a rival, 
what makes him think that, you know, awaking this evil beast is not going to have repercussions. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's a confidence misplaced, I think. You know, it's like it shows maybe a lack of awareness and even sleeping there between the rival who who is a danger, you know, because he is a rival and your association to him. You know, this brings additional danger. So that's that's where I, what I've got so far. And yeah. incidentally, that the other guy, the other sleeping partner is kind of like Don's uh, silent uh, brother in the back seat. Mm -hmm. It's a male figure, but I have no idea who it is or what he, what his association is. And and because of the situation, sleeping with these guys, it seems like we're somehow in cahoots. And and Putin is elsewhere. He's on the other end of the phone call. Yeah, it's it's a spy movie. Okay. Uh, we suddenly have been uh, draw, draw, drawn into Russian uh, intrigue, okay? And, and uh, uh, the, the, I think what the goal of this is to overthrow the husbands in the crazy woman dream. I mean, I think it's a plot to... Uh, uh, to overthrow that aspect in the crazy woman dream that wants to imprison the feminine. You know, so I think it's kind of an interlude on that. Uh, you know, I think that's what's happening here. We're actually visiting the husbands and the, uh, who are trying to imprison the feminine here. And uh, yet it's represented by Putin. What do you think, Roy? Yeah, I... It, it seems like I'm getting from this dream is Tim's in the middle. Tim's in the middle of two very powerful forces, the shadow figures that represent these forces. He's just a mortal human in the middle, what you would call a conflict of duty. And they're going to see what he's going to do. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, I, I thought it was kind of, in, I, I mean, I, I was very puzzled by the reaction of the dream ego in the crazy woman dream, how it was in cahoots with the husband, you know. Now here, it seems as a, like a little bit of a different chance to overthrow this aspect that is just um, being so negative to, it, the feminine is not interested or it mentioned here, but I mean, I still have not gotten over the, how brutal the feminine was to the crazy woman. What, what do you think, Charles? Um, the, I don't know, I, I get a shadow vibe from uh, Putin, but um, I think that the whole premise of uh, the Tim has to make a piece of art for him, mm -hmm. trying to understand that. I also think that um, it's interesting that the negative character in this, the antagonist, I suppose, is like an authority figure, someone that has like a lot of power and a lot of influence. Um, it's not just some guy that Tim doesn't like. He's like a He's in charge of a lot of resources. He has a lot at his disposal. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, it does seem like, um, I don't know what, the dream kind of ends at a spot where, you know, a whole lot could unfold. I mean, things could go any direction and have huge consequences um and um yeah i don't know um it it makes me think of like trying to um um call someone out like call this 
figure out that is quite possibly a antagonistic kind of negative, just makes you think of a kind of negative aspect of the masculine, uh, maybe like a, like the overbearing father with like too strict, too rigid, um, too critical. And he's trying to expose him, but um, he seems to, you know, it's kind of at the, at the mercy of this very powerful figure. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm still kind of thinking about it. Um, yeah, there is no feminine in it other than the one, the one element in there that's somewhat hopeful is the, uh, is the dog. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it feels to me like the, the dog suddenly gives me a kind of uh, power because Putin is concerned about the dog and the dog comes to me. It's the one non-liar in the group. And so it makes me think, okay, I've got something in terms of the, the instinctive that has the capacity to make an impact. But of course, I still have no control over anything in, in any aspect of it. Well, you know, what was interesting to me is this, is that in, in I mean, I think this is very related to the crazy woman dream. And, and this is why, in the crazy woman dream, there is a um, male aspect there who is doing things we really don't understand. It's very, uh, it, it is very spy-like, this one. See, now, if I were just to say this is a spy movie, it's a great start to a spy movie, you know? I mean, it's got some wonderful dramatic aspects in it already. And the, and the dream ego is surrounded by intrigue on all sides. You know, that's one of the, the things that we're, we're you, you know, think is, uh, is difficult about this dream. And yet, Roy, did you say anything yet? I did we yeah, skip I, I, oh, yeah. I, you, you asked me a few things, but you know, yeah, yeah, that's a good point about the dog. I think the dog is saying, well, the dark side, uh, the disruptor, Putin, uh, his dog likes Tim, so he doesn't fear Tim. And just like in the crazy woman dream, Tim went for the abused, I mean, the abusing husband, uh, but he was between the one crazy woman and the husband, and he decided with the crate with the, the abusing husband, which is conventional. But Putin is not conventional. You know, P Tim said he likes Putin. Why does he like Putin? Because of the way he disrupts hypocrisy. He might be evil himself, but he's not dumb. He's well read in history. And, and he knows how hypocritical countries are and he's worth listening to. And so uh, Tim's learning a lot. He's progressed from the crazy woman dream. He might turn on the abusing husband. Well, you, you know, in all of these dreams where we were barred from the house of the four women, we were barred from the uh, ritual midnight play of, uh, of Elise, and we were accused of not understanding the diorama in the dream of the iceberg diorama. And then, uh, and then we have this very mysterious Kremlin-like husband. We can't see him. He's in the Kremlin, you know. I mean, he's in this, this uh, very mysterious uh, Kremlin. It sort of reminds me of, of Kafka, you know. Uh, the, the castle, you know, nobody knows who's in charge, but somebody is in charge and he's uh, got it controlling everything. So to me, the answer why we were barred to the house of four women, the answer why we were barred to the place, play of Elise, and the answer to why we um, don't understand the iceberg dream is in the Kremlin, okay, of our own self, okay. 
there is all kinds of, of intrigue going on within, I mean, it's very Kafka-esque. It really, the dream ego is in the middle and on all sides, it's surrounded by uncertain uh, intrigue. And we don't know if we can trust any of them, okay? And there is this malevolent, very powerful, yet somewhat, um, you know, uh, uh, inscrutable figure in Putin. I mean, very inscrutable. You know, you you, you don't know what happens. He in every nothing happens overtly with Putin. It all happens sort of uh, covertly. You know, and then there's this other aspect that is um, is a a balance to him but we don't know if we can trust it. But now the thing is, if we could figure out this intrigue here, you know, the husband would have a much different relationship with the, with the, with the women who reside in the wild river. Let's not call them crazy because they're, they're only crazy in the Kremlin. They're not crazy by the wild river, you know, they live at the wild river, they are the wild river, okay. You know, so, so what aspect of us is hostile to the wild river, the women of the wild river? You know, now I don't think that the dream ego, our, our awareness, our personal awareness is hostile to the wild women. But there's some kind of, of, uh, of, say, a morality or ethic inside of us that is inhibiting and obstructive and uh, uh, not helpful. And we need to be liberated from it, whatever it is. You know, uh, Tim, Tim, didn't you, uh, I don't know, is this represent some kind of a, you think it might represent some type of, a, um, what was your religious upbringing? Well, I come from this really deeply religious family. My, my dad was a Methodist minister and my brother is one. Mm -hmm. And there's been Methodist ministers for generations back into the past. Methodists then, don't tend to be highly moralistic though. Right. You think you right. feel that they were highly moralistic? No. No, Methodists are really kind of social justice oriented. Right. And that's, that's how I come down. That's mm -hmm. how my family came down. So, you know, there's no dogma or any, anything like that in, in my um, upbringing. Mm -hmm. Now, let me, let me just ask you this. And it's just, um, uh, no. It's just throwing something out there and it doesn't mean anything, but um, do you think that, the, that the, the, the great mother or the eternal feminine within us um, do you think that they are somewhat put off by the fact that we want to relate to a cultural feminine archetype and not them, this living presence within us. Do they that, do? That sounds like a great question, yeah. Well, I mean, because that all happens in the ego, you know? I mean, when we're, where the ego is dealing with this, this social feminine, ah, that's not transformative. You know, because it all happens in the ego. The ego has, has to be in service to the transforming feminine. And it seems that it confuses us a little bit and that they're resentful of that. I mean, I don't think they're, I mean, I, I, the only thing that they're resentful about is um, it's fine to do that in the outer world if you know that's not your religion. It is, it's just, um, you know, you're helping to organize, say like, um, uh, you know, you're going to 
help at a uh, at a uh, uh, um, sandbagging when there's a flood or something. You know, that's fine. But if you take it and make it a religion, the inner feminine is going to be um, appended. I mean, I, and when I'm talking about inner feminine, I'm talking about the living feminine presence in our own personal destiny. Mm -hmm. That's not... Mm -hmm. One ahead. parallel I'm seeing is with, with Don's problem of the, the, you know, finding the power of the blood. And Healing. in this case, yeah. Healing you know, life essence. Yeah. What, what is the secret that would, that would rectify... Um, the blood so it's not poured down the drain. And in, in my case, what is the secret that would rectify um, my association with the wild woman in the river or somehow this um, attraction that the dog has? The dog is the one thing in it. Go ahead. Finish. So it seems like I have some capacity that I'm unaware of that has that easy association with the dog and with the wild woman in the river that makes See. that connection easily. And this also makes me think of um, making the artwork. Um, the only reason I say that I even bring up the art is that's the only thing I do. I mean, that's the only reason I would be called is because of that. It's not because, you know, I, I'm a, you know, a strong guy and I can help open the jar of pickles or something like that. Um, but then we get access to the inner workings of, I really think it's the inner workings of the insane asylum that wants to imprison yeah. the wild river, you know, and we're suddenly now uh, privy to it, you know. Right. And But, but again, the, um, I can't understand a word of the language. Yes. And but what do you say about it? You say something about it that you are privy to it, though. I'm astonished I'm privy to this inside conversation and yet can't understand a word. So that's not something that's impossible. If I studied no. the language, I would be able to understand the situation. If Dawn was able to find the key, she would be able to use the nurture of the power of the blood. So what, I, what is that missing element? Okay, there, well, I, I'm going to just tell you what I think. I mean, if it was my dream. Now, I'm not going to... See, now, I, I can only look at this in my own experience because I don't know your experience. You know, I don't know your experience. But I'm just... Let me just throw it out and, and uh, maybe some other people can talk about it. But um, what, what it seems to me is that... What my feminine tells me is um, it, it's very offended that I ignore her and don't treat her seriously. And she says things like, what, what do you think your life would be like without me? What do you think your life would be like without the Wild River? And yet you're assisting the Kremlin, which is trying to take me away from the Wild River and imprison me somewhere so I won't threaten the Kremlin anymore. Now we can't understand a word, but I think we know the drama. We know exactly what's happening. We don't need to know what the words are. We can tell by who's talking to whom and in what tone of voice, we have some inkling of the unfolding of the drama, you know, and the fact that this is at the highest levels, you know, I would say it's at the highest levels of our shadow self, okay? Our shadow self is the Kremlin, okay? And we've never had access to the Kremlin before. And suddenly the dream is allowing us in to the Kremlin, okay? To the inner sanctums of our own darkness, our own personal darkness. And suddenly we're there, the dream ego, which has just, it's always been at its back. It can't see it, doesn't know what the hell's going on. I mean, that's my, my feeling about my shadow. I, I don't know what the hell, where it is or what it is, you know. But suddenly you, 
been given access to it in, in, the, in its inner sanctum. And it's having pro its own problems, okay? You know, and its own problems is there's somewhat of a rivalry towards the authoritarian side and the more um, uh, freedom uh, uh, liberating side. So there's one side in it that is is frozen in concrete, and there's another. There's a there's um, a, a side that has overly coagulated, and another side that is salutio, you know. And they're in somewhat of a conflict, you know. But I think the one that has been uh, uh, thwarting us in the in the inner world is the Putin side, you know. Now, where does the Putin side of our shadow? So what I think this dream is telling us is uh, are we aware of our shadow? And if we're not, um, we're getting some clues about what it is. If we can assimilate the shadow, and this is a, 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 a very fabulous opportunity because the dream ego, which has been plagued by the shadow, but doesn't know who it is or where it is, uh, it's it's inside this, um, you know, uh, onion shaped domes over here where nobody can go into. If they ever go in, they never come out, you know. And uh, suddenly we're in the inner sanctums watching it all go on, and we don't understand a word, you know. But the drama is real. I mean, you read this thing; it's like a spy novel, and uh, there's a, a real aspect to this inner shadow world. Um, Roy, did you have something? Yeah. You want to add? Yes, uh, Tim. Why do you have why do why do you have access to the wild women? Why do you have access to the dog? Why do you have access to the peasants? It's because that's your transcendent function. That's the thing that's going to heal you. You have an attitude towards these people that they don't have great wisdom, that they're, you know, they don't have something of great importance. They do. I believe that's your key. Yeah, yeah I, I, this, this is a very important dream. I don't think we're understanding it, but it, it's, the more we're getting into it is, uh, it, you can tell by the power of the drama how important it is. The fact that we're fumbling around with it is irrelevant. What do you think, Gary? Hmm. You know, it's like he's moved in to a new realm. The new realm has its own language. He isn't conversant in that language. And so, you know, right now he's kind of stumbling around. And then Putin, which is probably you know, an aspect of himself which is out of balance sits at a desk in the middle. You know, it's a controlling factor. And so, you know, like Roy said, you know, the, the, the mission, the thing that has to be done is to look for the, for the transcendent function, you know. And I guess, you know, the dog looks like, you know, part of it. But the other thing is the, the rival. The rival is like the, the more conscious factor. Putin is unconscious. And the rival is perhaps conscious. And then, you know, and, and when he goes to sleep, he's with the rival. So, you know, there is a chance of gaining the rival's knowledge of of how to work this to to change putin you know to to do the transcendent function how, how is putin related to the the boots the boot oh well, the, the, uh, the my shadow's boots right Is yeah. what you're talking about yeah i'm not sure he has to put his boots outside so that Navatki can help him do the art. 
you know, Novotny is more the liberating saludio quality, but there is a, a, a this, this hidden, seemingly very powerful figure in Tim that wears army boots, that um, if the, given the, the chance, sergeant. what's that? He's, I call him the drill sergeant. Yeah, if it's, given it's the chance, nasty. But yeah, this nasty dark figure that is my shadow, I think. Yeah, that would if he's given the chance, he would imprison the transforming feminine within us. You know. Well, Putin can definitely be thought of as a drill sergeant. I mean, all controlling and you know can can do anything. Yeah, and and I mean, he's 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 the husband. He's the wearer of the army boots. Um, he's appeared here several times. Now the dog is sort of the animal helper, you know, that helps the uh, us lift the curse. And I think that Novotny, even though he's very mysterious and we don't know if we can trust him, he is the liberating presence too. But I, I really think, Tim, that you have, uh, and I want to hear what Charles says, but you, you've had... Um, you've been given a wonderful opportunity to view the shadow side in yourself close up, you know, and I don't know, have you ever had a dream like this before? Not that I recall, but I'll tell you one thing I'm thinking about is uh, one of the chapters of my life is that I was the first American artist to ever be invited to exhibit at the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. Oh, wow. And this happened like 25 years ago. And the experience was actually very close to what this dream is like in that there wasn't a terrible figure, but, um, but you know, I was in the middle of this really important activity and I'm the only guy that doesn't understand what's going on. And every so often, you know, the translator would turn to me during a conversation with all these curators in the museum. And she would say, oh, we're talking about security and do you want the machine guns in the exhibit? That kind of thing. Yeah. Was this when Yeltsin was in power or, or uh, Gorbachev? Yeltsin, it was. Yeltsin. Yeah. Um, and so th the association I'm bringing to this situation is that it was a transformative moment in my life. And even though I didn't understand it at the time, I can look back on it and know that it was this really powerful, magical, transformative experience, even though it wasn't my, my, um, my cognitive self that was participating. It was my- It's know, a mythological my moment. In yeah, life. very it, much. It really yeah. is. It has a mythological character to be in St. Petersburg, like one or two years after the fall of the Soviet Union. Yeah. And to still have all this apparatchiks running loose there, you know, no, who knows who's in charge. I mean, they're really, it's, it's in free fall chaos. Uh, it's a, but, but yet all the mystery of, of the Russian uh, past. I mean, is there really that much difference between the czars and between Lenin and Stalin and Gorbachev? There was this short period of Yeltsin and then we went to Putin. You know, I mean, it almost seems like the same government, you know, with different people in it. I mean, there's this, and it's very, it reminds me very much of, of Franz Kafka's The Trial and the Castle. Now, the, the, the important thing is though, that this is the description of our shadow. It is a powerful, intriguing figure, you know, and very wily and, and, and uh, two steps ahead of us. All the time you know and uh uh it's it's standing there now the dream ego is is walking around innocent of all this and is is astonished 
when it's going to the house of four women where it's barred from entrance. I didn't anticipate that. Well, maybe she saw somebody standing, looking over your shoulder, you know, Putin looking at her. You're not scary, but Putin sure as hell is. And he's standing right beside you, looking over your shoulder, you know. What, what do you think, Charles? Um, I haven't really been able to come up with a whole lot. I just, the uh, thought that came to me was um, that there is a chance to have some sort of uh, diplomacy with the shadow. Mm. And um, it makes me think of how like in my dreams, like the psyche or non-ego realm is Japan. So it's very far East and uh, strange language. And um, I feel like this is similar to where um, this is happening uh, far outside the boundaries of ego and uh, deep within the psyche in a, uh, in a strange and foreign land. Um, but yeah, there's a chance for diplomacy. Yeah, and, and see, now it, it's been a strange and foreign land nails it. You know, this, this, is, a, this is a place that we're not familiar with. He dream, he, Ego is not familiar with it all. But we know there's this sort of feeling in the background that there's a potential to topple this controlling, I mean, this, this very, um, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's the fact that it's linked to Putin and to the boots and to the husband that we don't see that owns the insane asylum means this, this, this is a very uh, uh, formidable opponent to ego, you know, and yet there seems to be factors at work that have the potential to topple it. It needs to be exposed that, that you and the unseen uh, uh, salutio aspect, the liberating aspect, seem to, at least he's at work in it. So there's this factor within you that is sort of your good angel who's, who's trying to assist you. And then the instinctive is there as well, the animal helper in the form of the dog. But I would say that this, as following up those, those feminine dreams, uh, the thwarting factor in everyone, we are now, con and you, nailed it with the name of your uh, dream, the confrontation. So who are, you, who are we confronting here? We are confronting the obstacle that occurred at least in the previous four dreams, you know? And uh, that is the factor that kept us out of the house for women. The factor that wanted to, uh, kept us from this, uh, which would have been a beautiful experience, beautiful experience. And then participating in the ritual with Elise, a transforming, beautiful experience at midnight, you know, and learning the mystery of the iceberg diorama, because we don't know it. And the, and the great mother knows that we don't know it. And then the, um, the, uh, I, I don't really know how to describe it, but it's 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 a very mythological. I mean, sort of reminds me of the feminine that's running away from this pursuing masculine energy in in Greek myth, the crazy wild woman grip river, who is is doing everything it can to maintain its uh, independent stance where the masculine is trying to totally dominate it. You know, okay, the husband. And uh, um, so in all four of those dreams, we are now confronting the aspect that kept us from the saving thing in every one of those four dreams. Yeah, and, and Don just put in a comment, could Putin's dog be the wild woman? I think that's, 
Yes. That's the same energy. She's closer to that yeah. wild woman than any anything else in there because it's this is a very unusual dream for Tim because it has uh, um, there is no feminine in it, but I think that's important. And I think what's what's important about it too, and I'm just saying that um, at some point in our life, uh, you you know, I I just don't think that we can. Um, we can become a tree that 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 uh, has leaves on both sides of it. We can do we can do all kinds of good works in the outer world, but they're still at the end all done by ego. Where here in our dreams, no ego, you can't do this. No, you can't do it. You need to become the empty vessel. For, the, for your own inner world, not his inner world or her inner world, your own inner world. You need to become its empty vessel and you need to forget about all that stuff outside because this is the critical mm. thing right now. Well, I feel like we squeezed all the juice out of this and maybe, yeah. you know, thinking about it or speaking on it will help. Yes, but I, think, I don't. I think Roy really nailed it. He said, Something like, you know, you have to liberate the, the transformative aspect, and that's that's the key to this. Thing. Yeah, I mean, see, instead of instead of helping uh, the the wild woman river, uh, you know, I mean, instead of, of helping the husband, wouldn't it have been nice if if you had um, uh, just uh, uh, helped the wild women? Yeah, go ahead, Tim or Roy. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me just get a H wise in on Putin. Now, Putin is the disruptor. He doesn't run the world. You know, he he doesn't have sanctions on the free world. The sanctions are from the free world on Putin. Uh, Putin has a dog. Remember, Carl had a dream with Lenin, and, and he was waffling around like you know he's not really associated with Lenin, but. He didn't mention the good parts of Lenin. Lenin was just magnificent with people. He loved people. And he also had a bunch of animals. He always had a bunch of animals, just like Putin. These, these people, they know culture. You said, you know, Nicholas II, Lenin, Stalin, it's all the same. It's been the same for thousands of years. The free world doesn't get it. They're getting this global thing we're ruled by consensus. It's, it, nobody made this decision. We had a consensus. Okay, that's the rival. Which one do you want to go with, Tim? Boy, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's kind of amazing that that the the, the beautiful dream maker. Here's the story of Novotny and Putin, and then suddenly says, "Oh yes." You know, let's, uh, let's, let's, I, I could compose a theme on that, you know. Well, anyway, yeah, it is something that let's dwell on it. But I, I really think, Tim, this is so intensely personal, you know. But I think the, on the other hand, it is um, ah, that, like, that we're totally, um, th this is all news to us. You know that we we're we're beholding now. I, you tell me if I'm wrong, but we're beholding something that we've never seen before. You know, I mean, it's um, we're in the inner worlds. I mean, this is the first time we've been able to confront almost face to face what in every other dream was was in. A uh, land far, far away, and we never could see it. All we got were its messengers bringing messages, and now suddenly we're there in the inner sanctum. You know, I mean, it's amazing. Well, anyway, yeah, let's uh, let's think about it. And uh, but Tim, we, you, you know, one thing I think is sometimes when when we say uh, we want the dream maker to follow up on a dream we had before. 
it's always going to trip us up. It's always going to send us what we least expected. And I think this is what I least expected. And I, but yet I get it. This is the perfect follow up to those four dreams, you know, and, uh, but will we get the message of it? I mean, now I want to say that that drawing that you did of the, uh, the, oh, we even forgot that one. The, uh, the woman on the couch. Okay. Now that was the a wonderful, uh, between the, the wild woman dream and this dream, that was sort of the bridge, you know. Yeah, maybe Putin is the, is the patch of poison ivy, I don't know. Yes, I mean, well, it, at least you, you went from the wild woman who was the most, the one most close to nature, and close to the unconscious, to the young witch, and then we go to the shadow. In all his, his, he's, he's a very powerful figure very formidable shadow. So we went from the young witch to the, to that. I mean, these, these are challenging dreams, Tim. I mean, they are challenging, but you, you know, what's, 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 what's um, so helpful about them. When I get a dream like this, I'm just saying, lay it on me, baby. You know, <laughs> I mean, because I need the truth. And these dreams are not lying to us. I don't think as particularly to you. But they are not, you can tell, this is not ego speaking to me. This is non-ego speaking to me, uh, speaking to ego. And it is, it is coming from a, 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 something that is containing ego and saying, you, okay, our, our our son-in-law one time, uh, just recently, I was listening to him talk and he's kind of a real, uh, you, you know, control freak. And he's talking to his boss and, you know, his boss kind of wants him to cut his staff a little bit, you know, and I'm listening to him talk on the phone and, uh, and I, I can't hear the other side of the conversation. And he says, get with the program. What do you mean get with the program? <laughs> he says, <laughs> He says, well, I don't, you know, he won't get with the program. Okay, well, I think that's what this, <laughs> these dreams are telling us is, hey, you're oblivious, you know? Now, you don't think you're oblivious, but in our eyes, and, and you see, what is, what is this little circle that contains ego interested in? our own personal, unique, inborn destiny and its rhizome and its unfolding in the universe. Not that person's or this person's or any other uh, cultural social event. It's saying, hey, you're not getting any younger. I mean, this is what it tells me. I'm not getting any younger. You know, you need to, at some point, are you ever going to get the message? I mean, that's what it's telling me. You know, it takes the clock uh, hand and puts it up at the top of the hour. Well, anyway, uh, Charles, did you want to uh, just quickly give us a dream real quick? I, I, Tim, it's, it's great. And I, like I say, this, I think this one is, is so mysterious and profound. I, I, I don't know whether we can, I mean, I think we've gotten some really good clues and, the, and that dream series so far has been beautiful. I don't know if whether I've ever seen a more beautiful, um, it'd be six dreams now. In a, in a, if you put those all together, uh, they are um, like you read a, a, a you, you know, like you got five, six plays, they're all different and yet they all have the same message, you know. Yeah. Uh, but but flow yeah. that way beautifully done thank you yeah. so charles did you have any uh uh dream that you want to start on next time yeah i had a dream just uh last night that was very interesting um and 
I guess I'll go ahead and introduce it, even though it's very difficult to explain towards the end. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, just read it, and uh, yeah, I think we got yeah. enough time for you just to read it. So I remember I was sitting on a couch in a living room of some house, and I was looking up and backwards at the ceiling behind me, and there was like a dozens of candles that were positioned to where like the light that they would cast would hit the ceiling and make a face. Uh, but the mouth of the face was actually a candle that was up on the ceiling. And so I was just kind of looking back at it and there was a man in the room with me who had apparently arranged them and like he had done that and we were exchanging some words, but I don't remember what we were talking about. Um, I couldn't see him and I didn't know who he was. But then I stopped looking at that and to my left, there are like tons of these tiny little creatures, maybe an inch tall. And they were lined up in groups all along like the arm of the sofa and along the like, um, like on the shelves and up along the wall, there are just like tons of them. And they're all holding candles. Like they all each had a little candle flame. And I take a big breath and with one gust, I blow out the vast majority of all their candles. And there's this tiny little female creature by my left hand who looks like, imagine if you made her skeleton out of paper clips and then took little pieces of white paper to like kind of make the flesh of her. But she looked like some weird Komodo dragon shaped. Didn't look like a Komodo dragon, but just the way the body shape was. Kind of elongated look. But this tiny little creature, and she touches my hand and says, oh, what a wonderful specimen. He is great, look at him. She crawls onto my hand and starts like touching my hand and my my veins on my hand were very pronounced and she was touching them and um then a small little toy train that was right next to her the size of a hot wheel began to slowly circle around my head and this is where it gets really strange i go into like i can imagine in in a mental state not physical i somehow get a Snickers ice cream bar. I get it with my mind. And it's very awkward and weird to do and it feels very strange, but I like grab it and I unwrap it and I start to eat it, but just in my mind. And it's a very strange, awkward feeling, but <clears throat> it kind of gets, brings a smirk on my face. Um, and, you know, I don't know what on earth it means, but I'm like, oh, yes, I, I understand now that um, Shaquille O'Neal would do this. He had the ability to do this also, and he would have this same kind of awkward smirk on his face. And now I can understand how that felt for him, and um, I can, like, relate to that now. And uh, yeah, that was the dream. Okay, well, well, great. Now that's one we're going to have to really segment. So if you can and uh, get it uh, in text, uh, we'll go through through that next time. And uh, of course, uh, Tim, if you have any further comments or we have any thoughts about your other dream, but I, I, I really am, am saying that um, this is a great revelation to me, at least. I mean, not of, of you personally, but of, of the fem the relationship between the feminine and the ego and the outer world, and the inner world and the shadow. And, the, and, and for me to be, if I could see my Kremlin shadow inner sanctum, I've never seen it before. So it's a great uh, thing. And Roy, if you, you, you come up with the dream too, if you can get one, okay? 
All right. Well, we'll, we'll start out with Charles' dream, but we'll also uh, kind of maybe um, uh, f- do some of, of Tim's dream to, uh, again, just a, a little bit of a follow up on it uh, on Wednesday, if, if everybody's here or whenever Tim's back. So anyway, well, thank you, everybody. I mean, this went by really fast. I can't believe it. <laughs> we'll right, see you thanks. later. Take care. Hey, thank you, Roy, Tim, Gary, Charles, and Don. Bye.